Welcome to General Revelation lesson number eight and we're talking about what is going to happen in the future. We've covered various things so far. We've looked at the rapture, the last event of the church age. We've looked at the first event of Daniel's 70th week, the covenant that is made between the Antichrist and Israel. Today, we want to begin looking at some of the judgments that are going to take place during the seven years of tribulation. And our topic for this lesson are the seal judgments. So we will get into those seven seals. We'll look at the text that speaks of them, uh, what each of the seven seal judgments uh, contain, and then we'll look at the timing, a uh, potential understanding of when the seal judgments take place in relationship to the tr seven years of tribulation. Our main text is found in Revelation chapter 5, 6, 7, and really the verse 1 of chapter 8. So uh, we'll, we'll look starting at chapter 5. Chapter 5 is one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible, actually chapter 4 and 5, as it gives such a picture of what the throne of heaven is like. I, I, I'm just always so excited about reading those two chapters and getting a glimpse of what we will see when we are in heaven and standing around God's throne and his angels and the throngs of people praising and worshiping God. So anyway, we're jumping in on that in chapter 5. I'm going to jump a little bit on the verses, and so I won't read the whole chapter, but just so you can get the context for these seal judgments. So Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back sealed up with seven seals. So this is the, our context. These seven seals are the seven seal judgments that we've labeled them. Verse 2. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And the text goes on to say that no one was found worthy of opening that, uh, those seals, of breaking its seals and opening this scroll, this book. Then verse 5, And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. So that lion is speaking of Jesus Christ. Jump down to verse 9. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy art thou to take the book and to break its seals. For thou wast slain and didst purchase for God with thy blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. That gives us the background then for chapter 6, where it describes each of these seven seals. Uh, Jesus is the one who was found worthy of opening these seals. It would speak of these judgments are coming from none other than Jesus himself. As he opens each seal, we'll begin in chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. And I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice of thunder, Come, and I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. A good label for seal number one is peace. A white horse 
was a symbol of victory for the Roman generals. After a victory in, in battle, uh, the general would ride a, a white horse in triumph. Uh, and notice a crown was given to him. It se seems to speak that uh, this is going to be one who is going to reign. Uh, and that reigning, that that power to rule is given to him. It's like it wasn't through battle or fighting, but uh, possibly it was uh, more of a peace uh, agreement, a, a peace movement, and this leader takes over. And it speaks of he who sat on it, this horse, uh, likely a reference to the Antichrist, the one who is going to be that one world ruler, and we see him taking over the various nations. It says he went out conquering. But notice he has a bow, but he doesn't have arrows. So possibly this is talking about a time of relative peace where the Antichrist is going to take over various nations to rule over them and to rule over them in seeming triumph, riding this white horse. The second seal, verses 3 and 4. And when he broke the second seal, I heard a second living creature saying, Come. And another, a red horse, went out. And to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men should slay one another. And a great sword was given to him. Notice, this rider has a great sword, and that peace is removed, it's taken from the earth. It's talking of open warfare, where it says that men will slay one another. So we label this second seal, war, that will take place on the earth. The third seal... And when he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand, and I heard, as it were, a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do no harm to the oil and the wine." This black horse speaks of famine and death. This is often what results after war. Basically, it's talking about uh, a day's wage was only sufficient to provide for one meal. And thus, it's talking of famine on the earth. The fourth seal, verses 7 and 8. And when he broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. And I looked, and behold, an ashen horse. And he who sat on it had the name Death. And Hades was following him. And authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. An ashen horse is literally a pale green. It's a word that's used elsewhere to describe vegetation in Mark 6.39. It speaks of death. And it says that a fourth of the population of the earth will die. If there are about 8 billion people in the world today, this would be speaking of 2 billion people who will die in this fourth seal. That's why we labeled it death, to get a perspective of this huge uh, catastrophe, death that's going to come upon the earth. COVID, there were worldwide, uh, the, the one site said 6.5 million people have died from COVID. Well, if there are 2 billion who are going to die during this fourth seal, that would be 300 times worse than COVID, if you can imagine 
the death that will take place. The fifth seal. And when he broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, wilt thou refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there is given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer, until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, should be completed also. So this fifth seal is speaking of martyrdom. These are believers who, because of their testimony for Jesus, died because of their faith during the tribulation time, there will be many who will come to know Jesus during these seven years. And many of them will die a martyr's death. Uh, and we see here that they are standing around the throne of heaven and crying out, how long, Lord, how long? But not all have come to Christ, uh, and so God is patiently waiting for all that will choose to follow him to come. You know, it's possible to wait until uh, the tribulation takes place, until the rapture takes place. It's possible to wait for trusting Christ and becoming a believer but oh, what it will be like for believers during the tribulation time. Don't delay in coming to Christ today. Don't wait until after the rapture has taken place to realize that what the Bible says is true. Trust him today as your personal savior. The sixth seal verses 12 to 17, and I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree cast its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind, and the sky was split apart like a scroll when it's rolled. Every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? This is talking of the convulsions of nature. The very heaven seems to collapse, and people are screaming from the rocks that those rocks would fall on them and hide them from the wrath. Now, it's interesting that they don't cry out in salvation, uh, even though they recognize that these judgments are, are coming uh, from the, the throne and him who sits on the throne, a recognition of God and yet uh, a, not a, a repentance for their sin and, and, and a coming to Christ, men's hearts will be greatly hardened during the tribulation time. And men will scream from the rocks to, to die and to hide them from the wrath of God uh, because of the greatness of that suffering. Now it's interesting about the seventh seal. We don't find the seventh seal until chapter 8. There's an interlude in chapter 7, a 
what you could call a silence. Uh, and a description is taking place of, of various things, but we don't see the seventh seal in chap until chapter 8 and verse 1. It says, And when he broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Silence would often speak of something ab about to happen. I don't know if you have noticed when a storm is coming, you will sometimes just before the storm comes, uh, the birds and everything outside becomes quiet. And that is what this is speaking of, a further judgment coming and there is a silence before that comes. But notice what takes place in verse 2. And it says in verse 2, And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Seven trumpets. Where did the seventh seal go? This is where... Uh, I sometimes joke and say that I'm going to speak of Chuckology. Uh, um, we don't know just for sure that the timing of the various judgments of God, the seal judgments here, and then now the seven trumpet judgments that are going to come, and later the seven bowl judgments. So my hypothesis that of the timing of these various judgments would look like this. If you'll notice the rapture, I turned our, our map, our picture kind of sideways. So now the rapture, the church age is at the top and then following the, the last event of the church age is the rapture. And, and then the covenant that's made, that's the first event of the tribulation. And the end of the tribulation is here at the bottom where it speaks of the second coming of Christ. And in between we have the seven seal judgments and the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments. But I want you to look, and this is where the hypothesis that it would be likely, it would seem that the scripture is saying that the sixth seal is taking place somewhere towards the middle of the tribulation time. But that seventh seal, this red large parentheses here, speaks of the seventh seal. What is the seventh seal? Well, it seems that the seventh seal is made up of the seven trumpets because there's a similar uh, lack of what is the seventh trumpet. And so my hypothesis is that the seventh trumpet is actually the seven bowl judgments. So the seventh seal are the seven trumpet judgments. And so what is the timing for the seal judgments? Well, actually, it's the entire tribulation time. The seventh seal will be completed at the end of the tribulation. One of the things I want to point out also is that notice how closely the judgments become towards the coming of Christ. It seems that the seal judgments at the beginning are spread out and then the judgments get closer and then closer together as the second coming of Christ comes. One of the reasons that I've interpreted that these seal judgments take place during the first half of the tribulation time is because of what's talked about next uh, in scripture. In the middle of the tribulation, the covenant is broken. We see this in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. We've looked at this previously. Uh, it talks about the Antichrist putting an end to the offerings. He's going to what's called the abomination of desolation, go into the temple and set himself up to be worshipped as God, and he will put an end to sacrifice and offerings. And we'll relate that to Revelation. The, the Daniel passage says, In the middle of the seven... 
In other words, three and a half years into the tribulation, he, the Antichrist, will put an end to sacrifice and offering. He's going to put an end to offerings to the Jehovah, uh, Yahweh, God, and he will uh, then require man to worship him. And we see that in Revelation chapter 13, where it says, all the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. And again, we talked about that beast uh, as being the Antichrist, the first half of Revelation chapter 13. And so it's talking here of in the middle of the tribulation time that the offerings are to God are going to cease and the Antichrist is going to be set up to be worshipped as God. Now another thing that's happening at the middle of the tribulation is there are two witnesses that are specifically mentioned in scripture. Now in chapter 7, there are 144 uh, Jews, 144,000 Jews who are uh, particularly set aside as witnesses that will go throughout the earth as witnesses to God. But there are two special witnesses that are talked about in Revelation 11. It says, I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1,260 days. That's where we get the, um, the number for three and a half years, 42 months, it's talking about here, 1,260 days, three and a half years, that basically at this time, these witnesses are going to be cut off. It goes on to say, if anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths. In other words, uh, they will have supernatural powers, these two witnesses. They will devour their enemies and the beast that comes up out from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. So even though they have power to fight off their enemies, eventually the Antichrist is going to kill them. It says, then their bodies uh, will lie in the street of the great city where also the Lord was crucified. So it's talking about Jerusalem here, that these two witnesses will be attacked and they'll be killed by the beast that comes out from the abyss from the antichrist will attack them overpower kill them and their bodies are going to lie in the street of jerusalem it goes on to say but after three and a half days a breath of life from god entered them and they stood on their feet so they're going to be resurrected from the dead they will come back to life. And it is something that the people of the earth are going to see, that they were dead. They, they were in the city uh, three and a half days uh, that they did not breathe. And then they came alive. And notice the response of the people. It says, and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. And thus we would ask the question, who are these two witnesses? Well, some have suggested that uh, these are not literal people. That is uh, just a symbol of the witnesses for Christ that they're going to die, but it would seem that uh, they, these two literally die and that they are resurrected and people look at them and are terrified because of, of what happens. It seems that there's no indication from the text that these are not literal people. So then we would ask, who are they? Well, some have suggested that this is Moses and Elijah. But again, uh, Moses has already died. He died once uh, and was resurrected. So it seems unlikely that he would die a second time and then be uh, called up to heaven. So 
Others have suggested that this was Enoch and Elijah because neither of them died on the earth. They were both taken up uh, alive to heaven. And so some would suggest that this was Enoch and uh, Elijah and that they came back to earth as these two witnesses. Well, for me, the text does not identify who these two witnesses are. And so I think it is best for us not to um, add to the text, not to try and surmise who these might be. We, we don't know, uh, but we know that these are uh, two men who are special witnesses for, for God, and they will be given supernatural power to overcome their enemies, but that eventually the Antichrist will overpower them and kill them, but only to see them raised from the dead, and that the, the earth, the people of the world, will look on them, uh, both lying in the streets of Jerusalem, dead for three and a half days, but then resurrected, and hear the voice as they go up to heaven. So, what should our response be to all this information? I like the prayer that uh, Tozer gives. I think it's an appropriate response. He, he said, Who wouldst not fear thee, O Lord God of hosts, most high and most terrible? For thou art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven and the heavens of heavens, the earth and all things that are therein. And in thy hand is the soul of every living thing. Thou sittest king upon the flood. Thou sittest king forever. Thou art a great king over all the earth. Thou art art clothed with strength, honor, and majesty are before thee. Amen. We worship a sovereign God who has a plan that will soon take place on this earth. We would be wise to submit to this God and to worship him as our sovereign king. Are you living for him, walking in obedience to him? If not, today would be a good day to begin. A time is coming where he will cast his wrath upon the earth. Today is the day of salvation. Trust him. For those of you who know them, walk in obedience to him, to his glory. May we be prepared, ready for that day.